Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to Cleaning Up the Mental Mess, a podcast where each week I discuss practical, simple and scientifically backed ways to help you take back control of your mental health, help others and ultimately live your happiest life. In this episode, I am interviewing Dr. Kelly McGonagall, who is a research psychologist, a lecturer at Stanford University, and an award-winning science writer. She's the author of the international bestseller, The Willpower Instinct, The Upside of Stress, and Yoga for Pain Relief. Her work has been published in 28 languages. Since 2000, she has taught dance, yoga, and group exercises in the San Francisco Bay Area. In today's episode, Kelly and I discuss her new book, The Joy of Movement, how exercise helps us find happiness, hope, connection, and courage. Kelly shares some great and simple tips on how to use exercise to feel more pleasure, reduce anxiety, and create deeper, more meaningful relationships, and how to use exercise to restore broken relationships. She also clears up some common misconceptions about the brain on exercise, how to make movement a daily habit, how exercise and movement in general can help give us more confidence and so much more. Just before we start, I want to thank everyone again who has left a review, subscribed to this podcast and shared it on social media with friends and family. Not only does your feedback help me improve each episode, but I really love seeing what you guys are learning and what takeaways you have. It's encouraging and exciting. And if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a five-star review. This information in this podcast is free. All I ask is that you share and subscribe. One more note before we begin. This interview was recorded remotely, so the audio quality may be a little scratchy in some areas. Now, back to today's episode. Kelly, thank you for taking time out of your schedule. And I'm very, very excited to talk about your new book. I've been an avid fan of yours for years. And I know you through your work on stress and willpower. And I am very, very excited to talk about your new book, The Joy of Movement, today. So welcome and thank you for joining me on the show. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay, Kelly, why do you do what you do? What keeps you motivated? How do you get where you are today? My primary motivation in life, I think, like, I was at a retreat once where they had you do that exercise. What do you want it to say on your tombstone? And I had joked, I hope it says, at least she tried. And I feel like in a very positive way, my goal in life is to be of some use to the world. And what keeps me motivated is the idea that I can get up this morning and do something that's going to make life easier or more meaningful or more joyful for other people, both the people who are in my immediate community. So if I get up and teach a class to that community and also to the broader world by sharing ideas, whether it's science or strategies that I hope will help people both deal with difficult circumstances and pursue the things that are personally meaningful and joyful. So that's what motivates me. And coffee. Coffee is very helpful. Oh my gosh, I'm sitting with a cup of coffee right next to me now. It's essential to life, definitely. I think I have coffee in my veins. I agree with that. That's so great. And I'm sure you're familiar with the research that when people help others, that it improves one's own functioning, mental health, et cetera, by 68%. I didn't know the exact percentage, but yes, this is a running theme in all of my work is encouraging people to view helping others, connection, service, as absolutely fundamental to well-being. So good. So good. I love that. Absolutely wonderful. I totally agree with you. Now, in your latest book, The Joy of Movement, and you and I had a little chat about the cover just before we started. It is the most beautiful cover, this bright pink cover, and it's called The Joy of Movement. And it's such a a fantastic book. The link will be in the show notes for everyone. I highly recommend this book to everyone. You explore how physical exercise can be a powerful antidote to the modern epidemic of depression and anxiety and loneliness. Can you talk about what inspired you to write this book and how movement is connected to happiness and just dealing with reduced mental health issues and just maybe a few tips, pieces of wisdom. So big picture, and then we can dive into the detail of the book. Yeah. So, well, so big picture, part of what inspired me to write this book is that I have been a group exercise instructor for 20 years. And I first fell in love with exercise when I was a kid. I have a temperamental disposition to anxiety and depression. And when I was growing up in the early 80s, 
They didn't take kids to therapy. There was nobody to help me deal with my mind and my emotions. And somehow I stumbled into doing aerobics through VHS tapes and calisthenics. And somehow my, my brain and my body said yes. And I discovered that I both could love it in the moment and that it was a really helpful thing for dealing with stress and anxiety that continued throughout my life. So that by the time I was studying psychology as a graduate student, I also started to teach dance and yoga and other forms of group exercise. And I've seen not only in my own life, but in those two decades of teaching people from all walks of life, all ages, all physical conditions, that exercise really is a profound way to support your mental well-being. It goes beyond a short-term endorphin rush. So this book, I really wanted to explore the science behind it, not so much to convince people to exercise, because I feel like there's enough persuasion out there that if you're the kind of person whose intellect is going to be motivated by hearing that it'll save your life or it'll reduce your risk of depression. I mean, you probably already heard that. I wanted to write a book that spoke more to the heart that really helped maybe people who already exercise understand why it's so important or to people who are part of the profession of helping people move, whether it's fitness instructors or psychologists who encourage people to exercise, to understand how deep this relationship is and feel affirmed in what they're doing. And I wanted to share science that has a feeling to it, that the science that can give you a sense of awe and wonder about how amazing the human body is and how responsive the human brain is when we choose to move our bodies. I wanted to share science that, that gives people hope about human nature, which is a big part of the book is not only why exercise is good for you, but why humans have the capacity for things like resilience and hope and cooperation. So that's sort of the big picture of it. From the, the nitty gritty data perspective, there are very few things I can say with confidence can contribute to your mental health and your happiness. And when you look at the data, whether we're talking about longitudinal studies, epidemiological studies, experiments, people who are more physically active are happier. They have more meaning in life. They have better relationships with other people. They experience more positive emotions like love and excitement and hope. And they are either protected from things like depression and anxiety, or if they're struggling with those things, it can be a very powerful antidote or therapy whether by itself or in combination with things like medication and psychological therapy. And when I say it's like at every level, I mean, there are studies that take people who are not active and randomize them to become active and they become less depressed and happier and have better relationships with others and more meaning in life. There are experiments that take people who exercise regularly and force them to become sedentary and they report becoming depressed and more anxious and having less meaning in life. There are studies that follow people for decades to look at the role that either being active or becoming more active plays on the trajectory of your mental health and well-being over years. The evidence is so strong that I wanted to get beyond saying this is true and really help people understand why it's true and particularly to share information that would give people a feeling of being able to marvel at how amazing both the body is and also how amazing human beings can be. Oh, I love that. It's such a fresh perspective because you know, just looking at like a couple of the comments on your press pack. And one of the things that I love is that the Joy of Movement is a revolutionary narrative that goes beyond the familiar arguments. As you said right at the beginning, we're all aware that exercise is good for us. I mean, you, you can't not know that. It's every magazine, every news media outlet is telling you it'll reduce the chances of Alzheimer's, it'll improve Alzheimer's, it'll improve this, it'll improve that. So we do know that. But you somehow illustrating that movement's integral to our happiness and our humanity. Let me give you a couple of examples of things that as I've been talking to people, I've realized that people really weren't aware of. And that I think puts the, the benefits of movement in a completely different framework. So one of the things I, I write about is that regular exercise sensitizes your brain to pleasure and joy. I think most people have heard, oh, exercise is a good way to deal with stress. But what we can see in studies that look at how exercise changes the brain over time is that it enhances the robustness of your reward system, the system of your brain that motivates you, that makes you expect that good things can happen, that help tell you when something is pleasurable, the systems of the brain that run on dopamine and endorphins and endocannabinoids, other brain chemicals that we associate with pleasure and happiness and joy, those systems of the brain become more responsive, more sensitive, better able to deliver the hope that you need, the motivation that you need. This is true for sort of all human beings. And it's particularly helpful for people who, for 
any reason, have a reward system that is not that robust, either because of depression or grief or neurological damage or a past experience with addiction. These are all things that can make the reward system less responsive and less sensitive to joy in life. And exercise, it is the only thing besides deep brain stimulation that I found in the literature that actually enhances your brain's ability to experience joy and pleasure. I feel like people don't think about exercise in that way. They might think about exercise as the the quick short-term endorphin rush where you feel better after you exercise, but without that deep understanding that you are literally training your brain to be able to enjoy a beautiful sunset or enjoy cuddling with your child or your pet or enjoy whatever it is that makes you happy. So that's one example. I can give so many examples. (laughs) That time of the month can already be an annoyance and buying safe tampons or pads just makes things worse. That's why my daughters and I love Lola. Lola is a female founded feminine care brand offering high quality period and sexual wellness products made with natural ingredients. Lola's tampons, pads, liners and cleansing wipes are all made with 100% organic cotton, no toxins, dyes or synthetic fibers. They also make it easier for women to get their feminine care products with customizable subscriptions to fit everybody's routine. Lola delivers exactly what she needs, exactly when she needs it. It's easy to edit your order, change your delivery frequency, skip a month or cancel your subscription at any time. Lola has made our lives a little less stressful. And the best part, every time you choose Lola, you're supporting a brand that gives back to women in need. To date, Lola has donated over 2 million period products and counting through their charity partner, I Support the Girls. It's never been easier to try Lola. Get started with a trial set today. Lola offers two trial sets, each featuring a mixed assortment of period products made with 100% organic cotton for just $5. Get 30% off your $5 trial set today. Visit mylola.com and enter Dr. Leaf to redeem your offer. The link and offer details will also be in the show notes. No, it's great. The examples are fantastic and give a few more as well. And I just want to emphasize for my listeners that what Kelly is saying about increasing your body's sensitivity to good stuff. In other words, you're going to be able to experience the things of life in a much more accessible way. Exercise is giving you accessibility to the ability to enjoy things in life. I mean, this is a whole different angle. I I love it. Okay, so here's another example. So speaking of the endorphin rush that you get from exercise, So there are a number of short-term changes in your brain when you are active. Anytime you get your heart rate up, you're breathing more deeply, your muscles are engaged. So it's any activity I'm talking about, swimming, cycling, dancing, gardening, walking, running, weightlifting, all of that stuff. The chemicals that tend to increase when you exercise are all brain chemicals that support social connection, endorphins, endocannabinoids, oxytocin, which is more likely to increase when you really work up a sweat, the the higher intensity exercise. But these are all chemicals that increase your ability to take joy in high fives and hugs and touch, that increase your willingness to trust others, that increase the warm glow that you get from telling stories and listening, from shared laughter, from helping people and cooperating, and I'm probably repeating myself, but all of these social joys, these brain chemicals very specifically enhance social connection. And I think a lot of people will know from their direct experience, if you are someone who exercises, I can't tell you how many people I talk to who say, this is why my spouse makes me go for a run, or this is why my partner says, you need to exercise. My husband will actually say that to me when I'm starting to succumb to anxiety or rumination. But in part, it's because that brain reset that you get, again, from any type of activity in relatively small doses, you know, we're talking 15, 20 minutes of movement of pretty much any intensity, particularly if you add in other things that you enjoy. So the right playlist can get the stuff going in as quickly as one song. Being active in nature can get these brain changes happening almost immediately. Even if you're like on what they call the dreadmill, you don't have a great playlist. So even if you're almost sort of like exercising against your will, if you persist at it for 15 or 20 minutes, you will get this brain chemistry. But if you are doing something you love, it happens sooner. And to think about that, that like every time you work out, you are priming your brain to make you a more social version of yourself who will be able to connect with family, friends, coworkers, strangers. I think this is one of the reasons why people who are physically active report less loneliness and greater belonging. 
Oh, I just love it. Deep, meaningful connection. As humans, we we made for deep, meaningful connection. And we know that, as you say, from a psychological point of view, and I know you look at anthropology and other things. In my research, I also look at quantum physics. And it's not about you. It's about you in the world. And exercise is such a fantastic way of doing this connection. And the way you explain it like that, I don't think people really see it like that. Yes, the community aspect, you exercise together. But you just said something that triggered something that happened in my life yesterday, because I do Orange Theory. And my daughters, I've got four kids and my second eldest daughter, got me into this and she happens to also be my producer and we're doing lots and lots of interviews at the moment we have a whole week blocked off where we're doing six seven interviews a day and all the prep and you know what that's like yourself when you're doing that kind of thing and we went to orange theory at the end of the evening last night and we were feeling so tired and almost feeling like at that point we were getting like irritable and flat and we went to orange theory and we came back and we were so hyped and so excited and talking non-stop and that connection and over dinner. And it's true. There was a transformation. There was a reconnect. Let me just highlight a few of the things that you shared in that story that might help listeners really harness this effect. By the way, there's in chapter one, I write about a woman who found a really great social support community through Orange Theory. I I don't name that brand. The story about Nikki Flammer, that was actually about Orange Theory. She was someone who tagged me on Facebook and said, are you writing about how exercise helps people form social connections because I can't believe like the social joy that I experience in this group workout that I'm going to. And so a couple of things that you mentioned, one of the reasons why I think Orange Theory is effective and there are a lot of places like this is there is this kind of do it together mentality. Everyone can, might be going at their own pace or doing what they can do. And also at the same time, when the coach calls out, like now we're going for an all out, your best effort, and everyone's doing it together, that's its own version of collective joy that allows you to work harder with a sense of purpose. And also we know that when you exercise with other people, because of the way that it it releases those brain chemicals, it makes you like and trust the people that you move with more. And so moving with other people is an amazing way to strengthen relationships. And I have heard from parents who move with their children, young children, adult children, that people who will choose to go for a walk or play pickup basketball, with someone that they want to bond with. And again, there's something something pretty special about movement that allows this to happen. Oh, I love that. It reminds me of my of the story of my son when he came home from school, the typical thing, how was your day? Fine. You know, they won one word. And then we'd go for a walk in the evening as a family with all the dogs and nonstop talk. He would just, as soon as we were moving, there was this incredible connection and communication. But that's fun what you said about the Orange Theory and about that story. And that's just wonderful. You know, there's also research showing that when people are walking and talking, they disclose more, like you just shared. They say more personal information they might not have revealed otherwise. They experience the listener as being more supportive. One article I read, they called it shoulder to shoulder support. That there's something about moving forward together. Maybe you're walking in sync, you're both looking in the same direction that allows for an intimacy that's not so overwhelming, like when you're sitting and staring at someone that allows for this kind of ease and comfort in which people can resolve conflicts, in which people can share things that they might not otherwise have felt comfortable sharing. And this is just, it's such a great thing to know whether you want to take a colleague for a walk to discuss some difficulty in the workplace or whether that's the time when you're going to have a conversation with a family member or a friend. Oh, I love it. That's fantastic. And that's what I love about, I've listened to quite a few of your podcasts on this as well, and you bring that up. I love how you say it's movement. It's not just like we think of exercise and we think of sweating for that hour in the gym or whatever, but you talking about movement in general. Talk a bit more about that. There are a couple of reasons to want to do that. So One thing I sometimes forget to say because I'm so immersed in this world is that I'm not talking about the kind of things that require you to be young, in perfect health, of any particular size or physical ability, that the joys I'm talking about and the effects that I'm talking about have been demonstrated in people with serious physical health challenges, disabilities, even in hospice care at the end of life, among people with severe mental health challenges, not only depression and anxiety, but severe mental illness. I think the word movement sometimes makes it more accessible because even though you could call it exercise, I'm talking about whatever you can do in the body that you have that does get your heart rate up a little bit, that helps you feel engaged in life, whether it's gardening, whether it's one of the gyms that I visited for the book is an adaptive training center where many people are in wheelchairs and they're boxing in wheelchairs. I went to a dance class for people with Parkinson's disease. At Juilliard, I remember hearing about that. It's lovely. And actually, there are, there are classes for this all over the world. I went to the one at Juilliard because personally, as a dancer, I wanted to take a class at Juilliard too. Like how amazing. 
Yeah, you have to say you've been to Juilliard. I mean, you just have to. <laughs> I know. I've taken a, I've been in the rehearsal rooms at Juilliard, but the, of course, that's special for the people with Parkinson's disease as well that they are having a true dance experience. And that's part of what I'm talking about now is that it's a true dance experience. It's not less than even though many people in the room are using walkers or in wheelchairs. They're dancing and it's beautiful and there's a live musician and the same thing was true at the, the gym where people are boxing. Yes, some of them are in wheelchairs and some of them have lost limbs in combat and some of them are recovering from strokes and they are fierce athletes doing incredible things that most people could not do even without disabilities or neurological disorders. I wanted to highlight that's one of the reasons to use the word movement is it's not even so much that I'm talking about not exercising. It's that it's what you can do with the body that you have that gives you a sense of engaging with life where you're using your muscles, you're breathing harder you're doing something hopefully that's fun or interesting, but that puts you in places that where you get to spend time with people who encourage you or in an environment that inspires you like being out in nature. That's what I mean by movement. And it all works. That's the amazing thing about it. There is no evidence that you have to do X, Y, or Z or exercise is not an effective antidepressant. There's no evidence that says if you want to have more purpose in life, you have to do this movement and not that. There seems to be no minimum dose in order to start getting benefits. And there is no activity that has been studied that I can find that doesn't produce some of these benefits. Isn't that incredible? That's just such a... Well, we're born to move. Yeah, it's fantastic. And look at all the benefits. I mean, why would we not? And it's as simple as, I think you said in one of the podcasts, it's as simple as moving around your own home is just to do it differently. Didn't you speak something a little bit about that? I have no idea. I've done so many interviews, but I will say, yes, my husband and I can be quite ridiculous at home. If you have kids, this is easier right? because you'll be a little less ridiculous. If you're going from the living room to the kitchen, why not crawl and act like an animal? Why not dance your way up the stairs? Everyone in my family, whether you are a kid or an adult, is required to be playful and ridiculous or joyful or put on music and dance. It's not exercise exactly, but of course it's doing the same things that exercise does. I love it. We have lots of stairs in our house and to our studio and all that kind of stuff. And I'm always on the stairs and I've always made a purpose to run up and down the stairs, use that to exercise effects. But since listening to reading this book of yours and listening to your podcast, I'm thinking, okay, Kelly will approve. I'm really moving now. You know, I'm not just running up the stairs. This is actually really good for me. Even when you make the bed, I mean, just to do it differently. I think you said something about that in one of the interviews too. There's something about mindset that matters too. I mean, every time you move your body, it's an opportunity to tell yourself that you're doing something that is like you're giving yourself a dose of happiness and hope that you are investing in your mental health. And so you're carrying things into the house. That's not physically different from going to the gym and doing something at like a CrossFit where you're flipping tires or lifting weights, but you just happen to be carrying your groceries in or things from the store into your home. Why not let yourself experience that as that's right. I'm strong. I lift heavy things. You can experience movement as an expression of your strength. You can experience movement as an expression of joy, as a celebration. So that's another way to think about bringing that mindset in. You probably have heard me say that no diet or exercise routine will work unless you get your mind and mindset right. That's why I love Noom. Noom is the habit-changing solution that helps users learn to develop a new relationship with food through personalized courses. Based on psychology, Noom teaches you why you do the things you do and empowers you with the tools you need to break bad habits and replace them with better ones. Noom is not a diet. Rather, it is a tool to help you develop the right mindsets around health, fitness, and food. Noom doesn't tell you what to do and what not to do. It teaches you how to look inside your own mind and make better decisions for yourself. Noom also connects you with a personally assigned goal specialist and community of other Noomers, so you'll have all the support you need to empower your change. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com forward slash Dr. Leaf. What do you have to lose? Visit Noom dot com forward slash Dr. Leaf to start your trial today. That's N-O-O-M dot com forward slash Dr. Leaf. The link and details will be in the show notes. 
I love that. I love that. Talking about the mental health mention that you popped in there, if people are feeling very stressed or angry or first to say stress is good for us, that's your whole big thing and got to make our perception of stress. Our perception of stress makes our body work differently. But if people are in a toxic stress mode where they're not managing their stress, and this is a lot of the work that I do is teaching people mind management and dealing with how to manage chronic and acute stresses and all that kind of stuff. Is there, in terms of movement, if someone's in a chronic mismanaged toxic stress straight where they're perceiving it incorrectly so their body's working against them instead of for them or they're incredibly angry and frustrated and not angry in the good sense but angry in the negative sense i know logically we all know that as soon as you channel that energy into movement you start feeling better can you talk about is there any specific type of movement and explain why when you move when you're angry or experiencing toxic stress it really changes how you function and your mindset and everything Yeah, let's talk about sort of the psychological part of it first. Can you remind me if I forget to talk about hope molecules? I wanted to ask you that next. I love that when you mentioned those two studies, I thought this is really cool. Okay, that was my next question. So I definitely won't forget. Let's start with the psychological. So when you're stressed out, one thing that I encourage people to do is to think about the different antidotes to stress or the different opposites of stress. Sometimes we think it has to be relaxation. That's one opposite or antidote to stress, but also there is courage and there is joy and there is playfulness and there is confidence and power. There is freedom and a sense of freedom. So there are a lot of different antidotes and opposites of stress. And I encourage people to think about the opposite version of stress that they particularly want to cultivate for themselves because it's a way that they want to be in the world. I know that I probably spent too much time in my life believing that the best form of stress reduction for me through movement would be relaxing yoga. The reason that that was probably not the right form for me was because when I get really stressed out and anxious, I become paralyzed. Like I don't want to do anything. I want to withdraw from the world. I want to hide. I want to go back to bed. So yeah, restorative yoga feels really great because it's basically putting myself in a cocoon. And that wasn't the antidote that I needed. Now, it's possible that it's the antidote that you need or that someone listening needs, but I really needed the antidote of bravery. I needed to find a way to actually re-engage. I needed more of a challenge response to stress rather than a paralysis response to stress. So I found that for me, when I'm feeling really stressed, which often takes the form of anxiety, that cardio kickboxing is actually the best form of movement for me because I get to feel fierce. The music that is used in those workouts is often using language about being a warrior, being strong, being brave, not giving up. And psychologically, it's the thing that is my medicine. It's what I need because of how stress is toxic for me, what it looks like when I'm not having a useful stress response. And so I encourage people to think about when they recognize what they would label as toxic stress. Do you feel despair? And maybe in that case, you need to find movement that makes you feel hopeful, makes you feel like you're moving forward. Oftentimes people find that outdoors. Oftentimes people find that in movement that requires speed, like running or cycling or skateboarding or whatever. So that sense of moving forward, of being free. Maybe your toxic version of stress is isolation, feeling disconnected from other people, And so the thing that you might need to do is put yourself in a social movement environment where you're being supported and encouraged by other people and you get to support and encourage other people like Orange Theory or a walking group or a dance class that to really think about what your antidote is. And it's why the other thing that I love about movement is dance, because it's a joyful, happy version of what I need when I'm stressed out. So kickboxing makes me feel brave and dancing makes me feel hopeful. That's usually what I choose. Do you have in your life, is there a form of movement that you feel? Yeah, I think so. You know, I'm listening to you very carefully and I'm thinking, first of all, this is absolutely brilliant. First of all, if it's toxic stress or the anger, what's the antidote? And then what do you need to get to the, if it's despair, get to hopeful and what movement makes you feel hopeful? The way you explained that is just fantastic. But if I think of like when I go and work, when I do Orange Theory, it just changes my whole mood. I think it's the group. I think it's the way that they change the pace of the workout. And then also the changes, not just the same thing over and over but it's constantly changing that's a lot of fun and you feel like your whole body's being worked out and you get so absorbed in what you're doing that it also helps you as a level of kind of a distraction definitely helps me unwind definitely helps me feel hopeful again I, I think that's true because sometimes you can be so tired or in our world where we're dealing with a lot of people telling us their problems <laughs> I'm always trying to help people fix things it can make you weary so when I go to something like Orange Theory 
that weariness lifts. So I think that's what you're explaining. And, you know, it's interesting when I looked at all of the studies that have looked at how movement changes mood in the short term, I started to realize that hope is actually the most common emotional side effect of exercise. It's very specific. No matter where you start, so you could start out feeling angry, which is high energy, high negativity, or sad, which is high negativity, low energy. It tends to move people in the direction of feeling more energized and more positive, which is really like that. That is the state of hope, the sense that something good is possible and I want to engage with life. I feel, I mean, hope is often defined as the belief that something good is possible and I'm ready and able to take steps in that direction. And I think that that's fascinating. And it probably has a lot to do with why the human brain rewards movement in the first place, that when you move, you're telling your brain, okay, I'm alive and I'm engaged with life. And your brain is like, all right, let me help you (laughs) by encouraging you to continue and to have faith that what you're doing matters. I agree with that. That engage with life thing is a vital component. I love that. And my daughter, when she was just thinking of taking that engage with life and just the whole concept of how you can channel that energy in that positive way, if that's the right way of explaining it. She always experiences the daughter I'd go to Orange Theory with. It's like a form of meditation. You think of meditation as just being all quiet and focused, but that's her meditation. She's focusing on her breath and her body responses, and she's becoming so aware of that side of her that it gives her mental energy a little bit of rest. She's channeled it into something else. So that's chi finds. I teach meditation. A lot of my scientific research has been on meditation, but I really do believe that physical movement can serve as a meditation for people who, if they try to sit down with their mind and their mind is just wandering or their mind is assaulting them with intrusive thoughts and memories. And a lot of people, the meditation doesn't provide, at least not for a while, doesn't provide the kind of relief that they're seeking. And many people experience that flow and that peace of mind and that mental quiet through movement. And there are good reasons for it. And we know that when you're physically active, the brain shifts to processing sensory information in a way that's very similar to if you sit down and try to focus on your breath or do a body scan, it really quiets down the inner chatter of the mind that might be worrying about the past or the future or might be criticizing yourself. You actually can see it happening. And so I really encourage people. I feel like sometimes in the wellness world, this idea that It's not real meditation unless you're sitting still. And if we define meditation as relief from the aspects of your mind that create suffering and being able to access states of mind that are uplifting, then movement is a wonderful form of meditation. Oh, I agree with you. I'm so glad you said it like that. That's incredible. Okay, so don't forget to tell us about hope molecules. Hope molecules. (laughs) Yes, this is my favorite scientific tidbit in the book. I think mine too. I think mine too. When you said that, I really loved it. I know. It took me a long time to figure out what chapter to put (laughs) them into. I I don't know why I saved it for the very last chapter. I, I hope people get to it. We now know only in the last 10 years or so that your muscles serve a function beyond moving your bones. People thought like what muscles do is they pull bones. And that's why you have biceps and quadriceps and gluteal muscles and all of that. But we now know that muscles also act as a kind of endocrine organ where your muscles are manufacturing all of these chemicals and proteins, and they're just sitting in vesicles in your muscles. And when you contract your muscles through exercise, your muscles release these proteins into your bloodstream, completely different set of proteins or chemicals than they would release if you were sedentary. The chemicals that get released into your bloodstream when you exercise, again, any form of movement, just muscle contraction that is continuous, they do a lot of things. I'll get to the hope part in a moment, but let me just say for anyone who cares about physical health. Some of those things, they're called myokines, which means propelled by your muscles. So myokines are released during exercise that kill cancer cells, that reduce inflammation, which is a common cause of both physical and mental health problems, that can boost your metabolism, that can help you control your blood sugar, all the things we think of are good for your immune system, all the things that we think of as important for physical health. When you exercise, your muscles are literally pumping out these molecules that are incredibly important for physical health. And some of those myokines actually have their strongest effects on the brain. So when you exercise, your muscles are pumping out these molecules and some of them travel through your bloodstream to the brain, where in your brain, their primary effect is to, in the immediate term, reduce depression and boost motivation. And in the long term, actually restructure your brain to make you more resilient to stress and to help people recover from things like trauma and depression. I found one paper from like 2013 or 2014 
where the people who are writing about these myokines said something along the lines of, have we discovered hope molecules? And I just loved that name because I thought, what a miracle that your muscles manufacture hope molecules and the way you can give them to your brain is any form of movement where you're contracting your muscles. It's an intravenous dose of hope. I love it. Intravenous, you can go on an IV of hope when you are doing your exercise. And there is some evidence that there's like a, a linear effect as well. So this is one of those things where the more you do, the better it seems to be. Some studies looking at people who exercise a lot and they have incredible levels of these beneficial myokines in their bloodstream. Wow, that's incredible. There's another study you spoke about as well with, I think it was the lactate and there was a couple. Isn't this incredible? Anyone who has ever exercised has probably heard lactic acid blamed for muscle soreness. And people will say, oh, you're sore because of the lactic acid, or you need to flush that lactic acid out of your muscles and out of your bloodstream. So we know that when you exercise and you use your muscles, you produce lactate or lactic acid, as it's sometimes called, as it's just a metabolic byproduct of exercise. It doesn't actually cause muscle soreness, but like that's another conversation. It's a metabolic byproduct of exercise. The latest research, again, this is really recent stuff. The last few years, a number of studies suggest that lactate that's produced from exercise, it also travels to your brain and it works like hope molecules. It's not considered a myokine in the same way because it's just a metabolic byproduct, that it too has antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects. And that's another thing, like when I said I wanted to write about science that isn't so much persuasive as it is, like it fills me with wonder and awe. I can't believe this thing that people have been complaining about for years and I'll take a cycling class and they're like, flush that lactic acid out. That lactic acid is making me braver, is making me more resilient to stress. Thank you, muscles. Exactly. It's fantastic. It is. It's incredible. I don't know about you, but uncomfortable shoes are one of the quickest ways to ruin my mood. But finding shoes that combine comfort with style is sometimes such a challenge. That's why I love Rothy's. Rothy's shoes are crazy comfortable, fully machine washable, come in an ever-changing array of colors, prints, and patterns, and they're available in a range of styles like sneakers, loafers, points, and more. They are the perfect combination of comfort and style. I have a few pairs now and cannot stop telling people about them. They also make great gifts, plus Rothy's always come with free shipping and free returns and exchanges. No risk, no worries, no reason not to try. And if that's not enough to convince you to try them, it will blow your mind that they are made from repurposed plastic water bottles. In fact, Rothy's has diverted over 35 million water bottles from landfills already. Check out all the amazing styles available right now at rothys.com forward slash Dr. Leaf. Go to rothys.com, R-O-T-H-Y-S.com slash Dr. Leaf to get your new favorite flats. Comfort, style, and sustainability. These are the shoes you've been waiting for. Head to rothys.com slash Dr. Leaf today. The link will also be in the show notes. Most people talk about the gut microbiome, as you know, a lot recently, there's a lot of information and how it helps the total mind-brain connection and the natural anti-anxiety benzos in our gut and all that kind of stuff and the serotonin. But now to know that kind of makes logical sense. And in our brain, the neurotransmitters, the fact that our muscles also release this. So they call it your myokinome. So it's like your microbiome, but your myokinome. And it's basically depending on how much you exercise and what type of exercise you have, you have different baseline and dynamic levels of these different myokines. And by the way, I should say, I'm not an expert on this. I didn't do a deep dive, but I know there's a great deal of research emerging that exercise also influences your gut microbiome in ways that are positive. It's one of the many ways that exercise can support mental health. It's also positively influencing your gut biome, although I'm not sure people totally understand how. I don't. <laughs> You're quite right there because I've interviewed quite a few functional medicine doctors and integrative medicine. All of them were making comments about that. People are becoming much more aware, the more holistic effects of movement and exercise and in the gut microbiome as well. So I totally agree with you. And I think there was a third effect that you spoke about. What was that third? Was it just the myokines and the lactin? Was there any other molecules as well that were released with exercise? Well, so one of the myokines that I write about in the book is irisin, which specifically targets cognitive functioning to a large degree. It also helps people be more resilient to stress. But one of the reasons people are especially interested in it is higher levels are associated with reduced risk of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, a lot of the things we think of as age-related decline, age-related brain disorders. What's really interesting is you can see 
changes in blood levels of irisin immediately after exercise and that people who exercise more often have higher resting levels of irisin. It's considered just one of the things that is being produced in your body when you exercise that is good for brain health. And I think like that's really the takeaway is if it were just one, that would be cool. But I mean, think about things we've just talked about in our conversation. We've talked about brain chemicals like endorphins and endocannabinoids and oxytocin and dopamine that influence your mood. We've talked about your muscles pushing out hope molecules and the lactic acid is actually supporting your mental health. We've talked about the gut microbiome at the biological level. Your whole body thrives. It's not like one mechanism, which is why I think you're not going to replace exercise with a pill or a vitamin. Exactly, exactly. And it's hard work. If people can see the time that is spent in mastering whatever exercise you do, people get that to a certain extent, but they don't get that with the mind. The point that I often tell people is that we all accept that it takes time to master a movement skill or an exercise or a type of gym movement or something. People don't always put that same effort into the mind. And just with what you've just spoken about now, when you show that, hey, this is going to strengthen your mind, it helps me with my work to tell people, hey, you know what? The exercise effort is going to help your mind too. It's one hand washes the other, that kind of thing. You mentioned that exercise is hard work or can be hard work. Sometimes people get very discouraged by like the use of the word hard or intense. And I do want to emphasize this is not an either or. You can also do movement that is pleasurable and not particularly intense, like gentle yoga, tai chi, walking, swimming. There are many movement forms that people experience as pleasurable while they're doing it that don't require pushing to this intensity that some people find just aversive or not possible because of other physical challenges. And so I want to make clear that There are probably specific psychological benefits to pushing yourself. You know, there's a reason people train for marathons and ultra marathons. And also, if you're looking to experience the brain benefits and the psychological benefits of movement, it's okay to do something where you never get out of breath, where you simply are experiencing a moment of flow or a moment of joy and it feels good in the body. There truly is no rule about it, except if you are moving your body, you are probably doing yourself some good. I'm so glad you brought that up because it was one of the questions I was going to ask you. And I'm so glad you brought it up at that point. It's made it hopeful, easy, freely accessible. It's not the scary thing that, oh, I've got to go to the gym and they never do it. You're actually just making it, well, this is just whatever you do, it's going to help you. And I love the fact that you also emphasize that if a marathon is what you're going for, if you feel like you need a heavy sweat and that's what makes you feel good, great. But if you don't, it's also okay as long as you're moving. And you can surprise yourself. So when I ask people, what is your greatest experience of pleasure in movement on social media? The one that I include in the book was this woman who in her 40s discovered kettlebell training. And she'd never done any kind of strength training before. And she didn't think she would like it. But it was being offered, I think, in like her local elementary school's cafeteria at night. She went and she tried it. And the sensation of holding this kettlebell, this heavy weight. And when she learned how to do what's called a power swing, she talked about it. I mean, it was incredible the amount of pleasure she discovered through the combination of strength and power and speed and grace that that single movement required and that it surprised her. She didn't know she would love it. And I feel like that's another thing if you're thinking, how do I bring more movement into my life? Be willing to take chances. If there's a movement that intrigues you, if there's some part of it, if it would inspire you to see somebody else do it, you should be willing to take risks and see how does it feel when you approach it and you can follow that thread of pleasure. I love that. It's a whole different angle. Follow that thread of pleasure with a movement. It's beautiful. I mean, it's like people think as you, that hard and exercise are very often used in the same sentence, and you've already addressed that. You've just explained again how important it is to have the enjoy the pleasure and the beauty of movement. I wanted to ask you about, and I know we've addressed this a little bit in terms of mental health. How do you see movement as helping to deal with the inner critic? Because that's such a big issue with we so hard on ourselves in general. It's a cross the board problem. You've sort of addressed this, but could you talk a little bit more about how movement can help us at this most fundamental level? Yeah. So I think it works both ways. Many people, unfortunately, have associated exercise for so long with body shaming, weight stigma, gym class trauma from childhood, that as soon as they even begin to move their bodies, the inner critic comes up and says, look at yourself in the mirror, or you're too old for this, or you're so out of shape. So I think that actually it's one of the things that keeps people from moving because they have the sense that as soon as they approach exercise in any form, the inner critic gets louder. 
And there may even be some projection, the concern that other people will be judging them as well. I think it's worth noting that that can be a real barrier to experiencing the joy of movement. And if that is your experience, it's not at all uncommon. At the same time, when you pay attention to your direct experience through movement, when you stop staring in the mirror and making critical thoughts about what you look like or the quality of your movement, when you actually pay attention to the direct experience of it, what often happens is you experience a sense of self that comes from the sensory feedback in your body, as opposed to what you see in the mirror or some story about what someone said to you last week or 30 years ago. And instead, you literally sense your own strength or you do a movement that is graceful and you sense your own grace or you're moving through a flow and you experience yourself as centered and grounded and balanced, you can literally sense these traits in yourself that give you a totally new way to think about yourself. And I think that's, again, another reason why people fall in love with certain movement forms is because they literally have sensations associated with qualities that they admire and want to express in themselves. So that's part of how it can help with the inner critics. The other thing I'll say is that that many people experience a kind of acceptance in movement communities when they find the right community that is deeply healing. And I'm not saying that every place you go is going to be exactly the right community for you. But after a little trial and error, people often find a place where they're welcomed, where they are encouraged, where people witness their strength, where people see their beauty, where they're celebrated and they get the chance to celebrate others and see other people grow and improve and move beautifully and powerfully in all sorts of different bodies and ages. And if you can find a community where that's happening, it's like you're dipping yourself into the like a warm bath of acceptance and common humanity. It's one of the reasons why I encourage people to find a movement community that they really enjoy, because movement is a wonderful way to practice accepting diversity of seeing the beauty in yourself and others. Yeah, so that's another way. Although serotonin is well known as a brain neurotransmitter, it is estimated that 90% of the body's serotonin is made in the digestive tract. Serotonin serves many functions in the human body, including playing a role in emotions and happiness. So, an unhappy gut can really make you unhappy. Fortunately, there's a solution to healing your gut and boosting serotonin production, probiotics. My favorite is the Daily Symbiotic by Seed, because it combines 24 clinically verified, naturally occurring probiotic strains with plant-based prebiotics that can help improve digestion, skin health, heart health, micronutrient synthesis, and help reduce bloating, alleviate occasional constipation, and more. A healthy gut makes a healthy mind and body. Get 15% off your first month of the daily symbiotic when you go to visit https forward slash seed dot com and use the code MENTALMESS at checkout. The link and offer details will also be in the show notes. That's so beautifully said. I love it. You said that so perfectly. And it just goes aligns with what you also said earlier on so well about finding what works for you, that there isn't one algorithm or one formula or one rule. So much up to the individual. You've given people so much freedom. You find what works for you. Any movement counts. As long as you get the whole community aspect, it's very freeing. It's a really beautiful way of looking at exercise. On that, I'd love to ask you a little bit about imposter syndrome. Everyone's talking about it at the moment. How do you think exercise can help someone overcome imposter syndrome and build self-confidence? Imposter syndrome, I mean, basically, it's the sense that you are being viewed in positive ways that you don't deserve, or you have been granted access to a role that you didn't earn. And in a way that is often flat out not true. And so I think that when it comes to imposter syndrome, there are a couple of ways that movement can be an antidote to that. Part is is what we've already talked about, that you gain confidence in yourself through movement, through what you're able to do, whether it's lifting something heavy or persisting in long distances. You come to sense yourself in your own strengths. Another is the way that it can support a growth mindset. So if you have a growth mindset, when you're in a new role or other people are praising you, rather than thinking, well, I don't deserve this because who I really am is not adequate or who I really am is I don't belong here. Someone with a growth mindset is going to think, I can really grow into this role. This is something I care about. And I've sensed that I'm somebody who, when I put in the effort, when I put in the energy, that I can change in ways that are meaningful and interesting. I can literally exert myself into 
what it is I want to do and who I want to become. You learn that through movement. Any movement form will teach you that. And the other thing I think that is so important, people experience interdependence in movement communities in a way that allows us to be more vulnerable and compassionate with ourselves and others. And that's part of imposter syndrome is feeling kind of isolated, maybe perceiving that other people have it together. Whereas you know your own internal struggles, maybe you, you can't see other people's internal struggles, you haven't seen their change narrative over time. There's something about movement communities where you get to help others, you get to see other people learn and grow, other people are encouraging you and you get to practice accepting help and coaching that supports that sense of we all have strengths, we all have vulnerabilities, and we're all learning and growing. One of the challenges with imposter syndrome is it often cuts people off from being willing to ask for help or be vulnerable because they're worried that people already view them as inadequate or they would then perceive them to be not deserving. And movement can teach us how actually fundamental it is to reach out for help and to be coached. Oh, I love that. What a fantastic answer. Now, you've written some amazing books as well. Another great book called The Willpower Instinct, How Self-Esteem Control Works, Why It Matters. You've written one on stress. We don't have time in this podcast to get into those, but I really want to. So I'd love to invite you back again and talk about those concepts because everything's interrelated, but from different angles. And you have so much to say and so much to share. It's so interesting. I love how you approach your work with such a scientific bend, yet you make it so accessible and you see it from such different angles angles, which is wonderful. Having written four books, I realize what the common theme in all of them is, which is that I believe it is possible to experience joy, hope, meaning and connection, even in really difficult circumstances, whether you are experiencing pain, whether you're experiencing depression, grief, loss, trauma, extreme stress, addiction, it's possible to experience those things. And each book is just, it's one piece of the puzzle in finding ways to access those human strengths, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, sort of wherever you are and starting where you are and believing that it's possible. Oh, I love that. And I was going to ask you for a final pearl of wisdom and you just gave it. So it's perfect. There you go. So where can people find out more about you, Kelly, your work and your books? Kelly and McGonagall.com. Also, if you just do an internet search for the joy of movement, you'll find me now on all the social media channels. Fantastic. And we'll have all the links in our show notes as well. Kelly, thank you so much. It's been so informative and very, very interesting. And I know it's incredibly helpful for so many people. My listeners will love what you've got to say. Thank you so much for your time. And I really look forward to having you back on the podcast again. Thanks. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com and to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leaf. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. This podcast represents the opinions of myself and my guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional for any individual medical questions you may have. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions or corrections of errors.